Hey pals, welcome back to a new video. Today, I wanted to talk to you about a little effect that I created uh, recently for Insignia. It is uh, something that I have not really been able to do for like the entirety of working on this game. It's only in the last couple of years that I've picked up the skills to figure it out. And uh, in this case, what I'm talking about is an acid pool effect. Uh, so I'll jump straight into, uh, into showing you what I'm talking about. Here is the effect. I'm really proud of this. Uh, what this essentially started as was I am working on a dungeon in the second chapter of Insignia and it takes place in this forest cavern place. There is like a disturbance in the natural order and so these pools of acid have started rising up and uh, flooding the place. Now this is a common theme, it's something that I've seen in, in films like Princess Mononoke, uh, the idea of you know radiation in real life and radioactive material, sludge or garbage runoff, oil spills. These are real things that seem to sort of permeate uh, media. It's funny because we have an understanding of how these things work, but in real life, I don't think I've ever seen a picture or anything that remotely looks like this kind of like pool of liquid with bubbles and it's sort of like a radioactive light coming off it. Although you'll see it in things like The Simpsons and Rick and Morty and all kinds of uh, science fiction and, and things of that nature. So let's sort of break down what the effect is how I implemented it and uh, yeah, let's get into it. What is the effect? Well, mechanically, it's a zone that represents like a hitbox. If you fall into the hitbox, you take some damage, the scene fades to black, the scene fades back in, and you return to the last safe position that you've been to. So uh, I can demonstrate that essentially. You just drop in and uh, you come back. Yeah, a little bit worse for wear, but still safe. This is a really standard way of handling this kind of uh, pitfall. Uh, situation for games, you know, like The Legend of Zelda, any kind of uh, adventure game where there aren't any levels or lives, it's just about sort of health. The idea of fading the scene, taking some health away, and returning you back uh, at a safe position is, is very common. So I was pretty confident that this is how I wanted to handle this. Color wise, originally I was going for green. I mean, green radioactive kind of acid is very common. It's kind of the most popular way of displaying something like this. Uh, but uh, it, it, it wasn't really going to work given that this is a forest environment and there's green everywhere I mean we could have gone for like a lighter green and I still could but I think in this case going for a color that clashes with the green Was uh, a smarter choice here. So I chose pink uh, Pink and purple is very common in games uh, to represent poison and poison acid isn't really uncommon as a concept either You can see this in games like Final Fantasy 7 Remake, or even Super Smash Brothers, the piranha plant has like a poison sort of acid. And these were inspirations as well. So I started with a simple box collider with an on trigger enter function that would run the uh, sort of reposition sequence and fade the scene out. Uh, and that was very easy to get going. It's something at this point in, in Insignia where I've got collisions and damage pretty much down pat, as well as fading the scene. That's something that I do quite commonly. So I was just using existing features for that. There were definitely a couple of pitfalls here around uh, what happens if you set the safe point at a point that's not safe. How do you actually determine what a safe point is? So you can see here, like there is ground where Armin is uh, standing. And then there's also the same kind of ground at the bottom of the pool. So if for whatever reason, Armin hits the bottom of the pool after getting hit by the liquid and after the respawn happens, then the safe point ends up being a point that's not safe and you'll end up in like a loop that will just kill you eventually. So uh, there's a little bit of logic around making sure that, you know, we set the safe points when we actually are in a safe position. Actually, one other bug that does appear here, which I'll show you now if you're really interested, is that uh, in this dungeon, there are more mechanics. One of them are these vines, these like swinging vines. And if you, uh, essentially, if you, if you pull these down, you can jump on the vine, right, and swing across it. And I'm really happy with where this is at at the moment. But if you happen to take damage and then get caught by the vine, you will uh, respawn, still childed to the vine transform, and you'll start swinging around uh, in space. So that was one bug that was very fun to solve. Uh, and once I had the features working, next was the visual aesthetic, which I'm sure you're all very interested in. Now, what you're looking at here is uh, four different things going on, okay? The first thing is we have a spring system for the surface of the water that 
creates these ripples and this tension, uh, which allows the uh, the thing to sort of like react to the bubbles popping. The bubbles are a particle system. There is also a shader happening over a mesh that's tied to those springs and uh, some light radiating off the top. Originally, you know, I considered doing like a hand-baked animation for this, but it really wasn't something that was on the cards because I wanted to be able to resize these pools depending on the size of the hole that I wanted. Uh, and this is dependent on the platforming challenges. So for the sake of, you know, allowing me to very quickly make lots of different sized liquid pools, uh, if I had hand drawn that, you could see why that wouldn't be very, um, very feasible. I could imagine doing some sort of tile based system. Uh, and I'm sure that's been done many times in games prior, but I think something like this feels a little more alive and more dynamic. So that's what I decided to do. Now, this sort of spring thing is not uh, a particularly original approach. I've seen this been done in a lot of different games, uh, specifically, you know, any kind of platformer where you can swim that's 2D. Uh, this is a really common way of handling what happens when the player sort of like splashes through uh, into the underside of the water. So the way this works is the spring system treats the surface of the water, so just the top layer, as a chain. And each point along the chain is a spring that can transfer energy to neighboring springs and also dampen the energy over time that it's containing. So it's sort of like if you apply some sort of velocity, that velocity sends it up and then that gets reflected and it bounces down. And as it's doing that, it's dampening, sort of like just like slowing down over time and every frame it's passing some of its energy to its neighbors and that allows for that sort of uh, surface tension kind of like um, you know cascading ripple effect that you're seeing here so it's great for those ripples but it's not really something that we could use to have any kind of uh, part of the volume of water leaving the pool right it's like a blanket you can't like have pieces flying out and you can't have pieces overlapping on top so to implement this the first thing that i did was use a sprite shape Unity's sprite shape controller is something that I've used quite a lot of recently. Uh, but I found that uh, whenever I tried to use many points and update those points every frame, the sprite shape controller just wasn't a very good vehicle for this. Uh, the reason why is because updating the points in a sprite shape causes the sprite shape to re-instantiate itself. And this has some garbage. Uh, implications so basically some memory needs to get cleaned up after and if you do it too often the garbage collector which is a feature of C sharp tries to step in and free up that memory every you know say one second and so you have these spikes every second of like uh, stuttering now uh, instead to solve this problem I used uh, a custom mesh so it's just like an actual 3d mesh uh, that's just being shown in 2d where I plot those points across the top of the mesh. Now this has the same problem as a sprite shape controller in that you can't really move any of the vertices uh, in a mesh without like essentially recalculating the mesh. However, meshes are so much lighter that the effect on the garbage collector is uh, essentially zero. Now, originally I had uh, random disturbances in the water. So just setting a spring's velocity to some number uh, just to create some sort of ripple because otherwise this thing just sits very still. Uh, and to spice things up, I added a sine wave offset. So you can see the rising and falling, even though uh, this isn't an ocean, and even though it's a still pool, you would expect it to be mostly still, but I thought giving it a little bit of a wave would make it feel more alive and just a bit more interesting to look at. So there's kind of like a time delayed sine wave that just undulates. Uh, you can see that the wave is, you know, a bit wider than the entire screen and undulates kind of like once per second or so. The rest of this, as far as the actual visual appearance of the liquid itself, is part of a shader. So I have this system in Unity that I created called Pixel Effects. Uh, basically what it does is there is a camera that looks just at the acid and moves the mesh into a special point in space where the normal camera can't see it and sends what it sees to a texture and then puts a quad with that texture back in the scene. When the texture is made, I can pixelate it. So it's kind of the same as how Unity's Pixel Perfect camera works. Uh, so I can pixelate that texture and I can shade it uh, with any kind of shader. So that's how I do my uh, Pixel Perfect effects in Unity. 
And so once I had it in Shadergraph, it was pretty straightforward to then uh, get this thing looking like how I wanted. Now, in order to determine what I wanted, I went into a sprite and just drew up something, uh, which I thought would look good and would be shadable. Shaders are really picky, right? You, you have to be able to describe what you want in mathematical terms, and it has to be an operation that exists essentially over the entire texture. You're talking in, in UV space, so you can't really talk about, oh, I want to shade, you know, this pixel with this tint. It's like, Okay, I want to offset the entire image and then, you know, do some operation that cancels out the overlap. And then if I can isolate the overlap, then I can shade that. It's very, very um, broad logic and it's, it's quite difficult to isolate. But if you've spent a lot of time in shaders like I have, you kind of get it, get the idea of how to do it. So I can talk through that very quickly if you want to look at it. Don't get too alarmed because it looks like a lot. But that's just how shader graph looks. Before I go any further, I'll just explain like what the effect is. So I take the texture. I offset that texture a few times. Once about 10 pixels down for the bulk of the surface. You can see that here. And then once again, another pixel down. And that's the highlight. That's the specular here. Then I take those components and I color them separately. I separate them, color them, and then recombine them again with the uh, original texture sort of working as the alpha cutout. So it's a mask uh, over the original texture. And that gets us this lovely water. This space in the middle wouldn't normally be there. It's just that the circle happens to touch the top of the texture. So I can't isolate it, but it, effectively there's like a pixel that runs across here of the highlight as well. The highlight would run across the entirety of the thing. So that's what's happening here. The first thing you'll notice is right up the back, we can see, uh, and this came quite late in the piece. This is just a standard UV that is being uh, filtered through some noise. This is gradient noise. It's just like a static of a TV, but blurrier. That's how you can think about it. And that is being offset over time. So this is just time being multiplied by some number so I can slow it down. Uh, that's being put into the X component of a vector, which offsets uh, the noise. So we're just moving forward in time, essentially. And then we're moving some noise forward in time, multiplying that by a number, and then adding it. We're doing some maths here basically to get our offset. So our visual sort of vertical offset. So there's three components, the body, the top face, and then the specular. And that's one, two, three three. The top face in the specular are the ones that get offset through noise like this. And there's just some mathematical operations that just, you know, we're just adding things together. We're isolating things by, you know, culling anything that's not above a certain brightness. And that lets us get this. Um, same sort of thing here where we're cutting away everything that's not this 50% range. And then we're just mu multiplying them by a color. Like in this case, I'm just tinting it purple or tinting it pink. And the reason why I would do this is to have some sort of like precision over the output. So in the first go, I was just doing sort of like a color multiple over the entire thing. But when you multiply by a color, you're just going up through brightness. Whereas in my game, there's a palette that describes all the colors. And so rather than moving up in brightness, I'm moving up through the palette. Right, so this is one palette color, another palette color, and a third. And that's how I make it look like it belongs in my game. Uh, it's a minor thing, but I think it, it goes a long way here. So you can see that these are the different palette colors that are being applied into those different split versions. This doesn't actually get used at all. I just kept it here for the sake of it. Same thing with this. For a while, I was thinking of having the bubbles be a texture that repeats and shifts upwards, and I just abandoned that. But it's fun to keep it there just in case. That's it really, you know, once I have all those colors, I merge them with a custom union node. So I just like layer them back on together and keep the stuff that's on top and then mask them out by the original texture again. And voila, that's, that's the output. So that's what we're seeing here. One thing to note about this is that there are now two different functions that control the uh, thickness of the top of the water, right? We have like one being the noise offset, creating one undulation. That's what I guess you would call like the foreground wave. 
and then the background wave, which is like the actual mask of the mesh itself, is controlled just by a sine wave. And I think the two of those things being in and out of phase uh, helps really sell this as being something with depth. So uh, the third thing is the particle system. Particle systems are pretty easy in Unity. It's, it's very straightforward. You just load up a particle system component and tweak a bunch of knobs until you get something that looks like what you want. Uh, in this case, I have an, uh, an edge along the bottom of the pool and that spawns the particles up. The particles grow in size as they age, so over time. And then I have a script that looks at all the particles and when the particles breach the surface of the water, I disable them and create a sub emitter particle system which does the little splash so that's another particle system as well and that keeps things random and uh, and nice and interesting at the same time when I instantiate that splash that's when I add that velocity to the spring system and that creates that lovely ripple across the top as well the particles are just a sprite that I created in a sprite and there's not, not really much going on there it's just a single image and to top things off I added a glowing light 2d component to the entire volume of the thing. It's it's just a standard component that you can get in the package manager. It's part of the URP, the universal render pipeline. And uh, in this case, it's just a pink light that's just sitting behind it. I was thinking about doing mist or smoke, but uh, honestly, uh, this kind of got me most of the way there. I could still do it, but we'll see. Uh, for now, I would say this is pretty much where it needs to be. So that's it. Pretty straightforward, actually. Um, as complicated as this could have been, you know, sometimes I get a bit stuck with something. There are a lot of technical uh, things like for a while I was trying to have the particles uh, pop on collision with like a, a volume that sits on top, like a box collider on the top of the, of the actual uh, lake. And capturing the collision of the particles was a little difficult. Saving the particles back into the particle system is kind of tricky and just getting the actual thing to look like it lives in the scene is also quite difficult. Um, one thing about my camera system is that when the texture gets saved to the camera and then the camera moves, the actual resulting output is one frame late because it's looking at information from the previous frame. So as the camera moves, the actual lake is shifting very slightly by the distance, the delta of the camera position from the previous frame. And to counteract that, I sort of just like add that back in. So I just say, oh, just if we've moved to the right, move to the right a little bit by that same amount that we were at last frame. And so the lake's actually sort of like catching up to the camera <laughs> just a little bit uh, on every frame. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's something that I'm pretty happy with. I, to be honest, was not expecting it to come out this well. And there were things that I really expected to do that I chose not to do once I was prototyping it. Like I really thought that the bubbles would need to be a different color as they broke the surface. Uh, I really thought that I would have to animate them and that uh, there would be a lot of difficulty around the actual layering of this stuff. So the bubbles, you know, you can see that the bubbles are really behind the lake, but they don't really look like they're behind it. Um, unless you're looking at the very, very top, that surface layer, as they're coming up through the through the surface, you would expect them, you know, to be uh, in front of, a, you know, the amount of water that was, you know, relative to where they were positioned in the lake. So like, rather than just appearing out of the back, you would expect them to be appearing somewhere in the middle, right? But they don't do that because there, there is no top face. It's just, it's just a flat texture. But honestly, that kind of stuff, it seems really picky now in retrospect. And I guess this is a kind of takeaway that if you approach things, you know, trying to, you know, solve first things first, in this case, the functionality, and then just increment towards the destination that you want, you know, the final look that you're looking for. Uh, sometimes you find that good enough is better than what you expected and comes a bit sooner. And for me, this has been a bit of a lesson because, you know, I'm the kind of person who really likes to overthink this kind of stuff and overthinking leads to anxiety. And so, you know, there were a couple of weeks back there between when I first implemented the actual physics of it uh, and when I did the visuals where I was thinking, oh, this is just like going to take me way longer and 
I, I'm going to be tweaking it for ages and ages. And how am I going to make this thing work? And ultimately, if you just jump in and start and just have fun with it, it's easier enough. And it's likely that you'll actually hit something that you like and just have fun discovering where that thing takes you rather than uh, trying to solve it all in advance. When I was uh, at university, I had like a, like a supervisor for my honors who was a bit of a mentor and he used to say, uh, not his quote, but it's a quote that he would quote to me, which is that premature optimization is the mother of all evil. And I believe that it's, it's true. If you try to solve problems before their problems, you get nowhere. So that's it. I made an acid pool and uh, I really like how it looks. And I think it really makes this scene and feels like something that's threatening and dangerous. So yeah, thanks for watching. I will catch you very soon with more updates from Insignia and more tutorials for the pixel art class that you've been enjoying so much. Thank you everyone for your support. Uh, this channel is growing dangerously close to 100k subs and uh, as we near the end of the year I just want to reflect on like how quickly that's happened. In January we were at 20k I think. So to reach 100 is uh, it's kind of ridiculous and I just want to thank you all for for doing that hoping you have a very happy holiday if I don't make another video between now and then and I'll see you in the next one hey pal thanks for watching and thanks most especially to the patrons and twitch subs who support this channel and my game dev project insignia to find out more click the links in the description below and uh, if you like this video tell YouTube by clicking the like button and then YouTube will tell me and then I'll make more videos that's nice Thanks again, and uh, until next time.